Second Kings chapter seven. So last week we dealt with the chapter, which is one of the harder chapters to preach, preach through as we read the story of, of what was happening. The city was besieged, and as the enemies surrounded the city, not to let anyone out, not to let anybody in, they couldn't get any food, and there was a horrible famine in the land. And we talked about how God warned them and told them that if they disobey him, then this is exactly what was going to happen. So it's not something that you're thinking, how could the Lord allow this? He told them, if you disobey me, this is what's going to happen. There's going to be a famine in the, in the, in the land. The this, this city is going to be besieged, and you're going to be basically eating your own children. And it is a horrible thing. Imagine when, the, when they heard those words and they thought, wow, why is he saying that? And then we see this is exactly what happened. Now, some say, as I'm studying this out, that these children had already passed away when they, when they um, boiled them to eat them. In either way, it is horrific. However you want to think it went, it was horrific. And so that was going on. And when the king saw what was happening as he toured the, the city, his anger went out against God's prophet and he blamed him and in essence of course blaming God and that's what that's what happens and if you've ever listened to any of the debates between Christians a Christian apologist and atheist a lot of times you don't get the impression that the atheist doesn't believe in God you get the impression that they're mad at God and that they're blaming God because I'm thinking if you don't believe there is a God then why are you who are you mad at because they seem to be so mad. And I used to listen to a lot of, of debates, and that's how it seemed. So if you remember when we were, were looking at this chapter in chapter 6 last week, in verse, we'll just read the last few verses. In verse 30 of chapter 6, and it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman talking about the, what her, her problem was. I won't read that again. <laughs> you can if you want to. When the king heard the words of the woman that he rent his clothes and he passed by upon the wall and the people looked and behold he had sackcloth within upon his flesh as a sign of mourning that he put on sackcloth. It's a real itchy. A sign of mourning. Then he said, God do so, and more also to me, if the head of Elisha, the, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. And he says, I'm going to kill this. Because of this man, Elisha, this is happening. I'm going to kill him. May God punish me worse than the things that we are seeing if this, if this does not happen to Elisha this day. God do so and more also to me if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. But Elisha sat in his house, and the elders sat with him. And the king sent a man from before him, and ere the messenger came to him, before he even got there, and he said to the elders, See ye how this son of a murderer had sent to take away mine head? He says he's the one that's the, the problem. Look, when the messenger cometh, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? And while he yet talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto him. And he said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What should I wait for the Lord any longer? So here they come to talk to the man of God. And so they're upset. The king is upset. He's, he, he, he says, Relay the message that that he's going to lose his head today and give him the message of what the king had said, that he said, may God do more to me than all this horrible thing, all the horrible things that are happening in the land if, if Elisha's head is not removed from off his body. And so they come to Elisha, and Elisha's like, okay, well, I got a message for the king. Now, what kind of message do you think it's going to be? You think that 
the message was, is going to be okay. Well, you want to know something? No, I'm not going to lose my head. You're going to lose your head. And that's, that's not what happens. That's not what the word is. Now, if you were God, what would you say to this king? What would the message be? It's just so interesting that the way, the word that he has Elisha speak. Verse 7. Now remember, the, the prophet speaks on behalf of God. So when the prophet speaks, this is, thus saith the Lord, this is the word of God. It's not like the equivalent of a, of a pastor. No, I'm a pastor, and I'm preaching the word of God, and the word of God is authoritative. The word of God is not returned void. The word of God is inspired. It's quick. It's sharper. It's more powerful than any two-edged sword. But when I am preaching, there could be, at some point in time, I might say something as an opinion that's not correct. I mean, in fact, one time I think in 1989, I might have said something. One time I thought, I did make a mistake. I did make a mistake one time. I thought I was wrong, but I wasn't. So the mistake I made was thinking that I was wrong. So, you know, we can, we can all make mistakes, right? <laughs> Where's my son? Can you ask me some water? It's a blessing to have uh, my son back. But, um, no, a pastor is human. <laughs> so sometimes at other churches, you know, they say things wrong all the time. <laughs> Someone might say, do you think you're right on everything? Well, I mean, I'd hate to be preaching something I know is wrong. <laughs> Of course, obviously, there are some times where there might be some things we change our mind on or some things that I've, I've heard some, sometimes a message I preached years ago, and I, I might think to myself, I don't really see it that way now. Or there's some things that, you know, I've learned more uh, about that particular topic or subject. Or I, I've learned more where I, I don't see it that way. Or, you know, there's things like that. We're human. We're, we're learning. We're growing. We're human at best. We're going to say things that are wrong. We're going to make mistakes there's going to be some times where we might give the wrong advice. Not on purpose, hopefully. <laughs> but there might be something, yeah, I, I kind of wish I didn't have, wouldn't have said it like that or said that. But, but the prophet, when he spoke on behalf of God, he is saying what God wants him to say. And God never makes any mistakes. So this is what he says to him, and it seems a little Seems odd. I mean, someone makes this kind of makes these threatening words, and here's Elisha the prophet speaking on behalf of God, and he says basically this: "Don't worry, everything's going to be good tomorrow." <laughs> he says you're going to have lots of food, so it's going to be all good. Don't worry about it. That's what he. That's what it says. So and while he had talked, in verse 33 of the, the last verse of chapter 6, and while he had talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto him, and he said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What, what should I wait for the Lord any longer? Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Tomorrow, about this time, shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Now, you remember what was happening the day before? It was going to be a very expensive for them to buy a donkey's head. Now, there's not a lot of, I mean, I don't know if you've ever eaten donkey's head. I'm sure, what, you haven't, Robert? Ever see Robert eat chicken? I mean, after he finishes eating the chicken, when they throw the bones away, the cockroaches are so excited, they look at There's nothing left. <laughs> There's nothing left on there. 
it's completely gone. Well, that's kind of what they were doing. They, were, they would pick that donkey's head clean. And so then they would throw the, the rubbish over the gate of the city. And then the, those that were the lepers or those that were beggars, they would eat all, they would pick through the, through the garbage. But if there's a famine in the land and people are spending a lot of their hard earned money on a donkey's head to pick it clean, you know that those that are the scavengers or those that are the, the, um, the beggars, there's not going to get much. <laughs> And now he's saying that tomorrow shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel. It's just pocket change, and you're going to be able to get some good grain, some good food. So things are going to turn around. Two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. So that seems hard to believe when right now, you remember how it was going to cost a lot of money for a cup of dove's dung? Now, supposedly that was some kind of a food concoction. Some say, no, it really was dove's dung. You know, I'm not sure. But in either case, it was you had to spend a lot of money to get something like that. <laughs> donkey's head and dove's dung. What's on the menu? Oh, we get donkey's head, dove's dung. We get a cup of dove's dung and, you know, half a donkey's head. Now, that's what was going on. That's what they had to eat. And then now he's saying tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. So before, it's going to take your whole paycheck to get something detestable. Now... It's just going to take a couple dollars, and you're going to have some serious, as we'd say in Hawaii, some serious grinds. <laughs> so before, you're getting, I don't know what we can compare it to, <laughs> your whole paycheck, and then you're just going to get, I don't know. Well, what is it, something that's not that great? You can get one, one can of um, <laughs> Vienna sausage. Your whole paycheck for one can of Vienna sausage. Your whole paycheck, you work all month and you can get one. And so you can give it to your kids. Can you get one sausage, you get one sausage, you get one sausage. And then you're drinking the, the sauce, the juicing. Because I like that. I like this. Yeah, oh, I like that, man. Yeah, it's good. And now, five bucks, you get one. Deluxe plate lunch, mixed plate, extra scoop rice, extra scoop mac salad. For five, yeah. No, that's the miracle. That's the miracle you're talking about. And so that's, a, that's what people were saying when the word went out. Now, if God says this, that you're going to be able to get this kind of food at this time tomorrow, when right now you're spending your whole paycheck on one can Vienna sausage, but tomorrow, five bucks for a deluxe plate lunch, mixed plate, extra scoop rice, extra scoop mac salad, you'd be thinking, no ways. Come on. How could that happen? And I think it's actually even more exaggerated than that. We're under-exaggerating it. Like it was even more extreme than that. So here they come. Uh, you know, th there's a famine in the land. They're, the people, the, they are actually eating their own children. Things were so horrific and now the word comes from the man of God. Well, tomorrow, food will be cheap. And it's going to be in abundance. What? No way. So that's what's happening. So the, I'll give you the points first. 
So the first thing, verse 1, is divine prophecy. The second point is doubt. Are there a, are there a lot of doubters today? What does it say in um, Second Peter that... Let me read it just so, so I can... Because so I'm probably going to quote it wrong. In Second Peter, there's doubters today. There are people that laugh, you know, when you talk about prophecy. It says, knowing this, this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, willingly ignorant that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So they're willingly ignorant. They're scoffers in the last days saying this. Where is the promise of his coming? They're mocking. They're scoffers. What's that? Oh, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. Or verse 3 to 5, because the verse it says they're willingly ignorant is verse 5. So in this scripture, in this passage, we see divine prophecy, and then we see doubt. And then the third point, verses 3 and 4, is decisions. Decisions. We're all going to make a decision. Then verses 5 through 8, delight. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he will give thee the desires of thine heart. Declare is verses 9 through 11. Denounce, verse 12. And definite fulfillment, verse 13 through 20. So divine prophecy, verse 1. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. You know when it's thus saith the Lord. Mark it down. It's going it's to happen. Tomorrow, about this time, shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Now, what did, what did Jesus promise? He said that he's coming back for us, right? In John 14, he says, I will come again. I, I am coming back for you. You can mark it down if he says he's coming back for us. He's coming back for us. So God promises in 24 hours the economic situation in Samaria would be completely reversed. Instead of scarcity, there would be such abundance that the food prices was, would radically drop in the city. So that divine prophecy... A measure of fine flour for a shekel, two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. And remember how the cities were built, and so you have the gate of the city, and, and at the gate of the city would be where you would have the court. You know, all the legal disputes would be settled there, and also you would have uh, um, the, the beggars that would be sitting outside of the gate, so then all the food or all the rubbish that was thrown over, they would be able to get that. So they were also at the gate of the city, and most of the, the elders, they would sit there because they're the ones that had the, uh, they were the wise men of the city. So anytime there was any legal proceedings or any, or any of the government leaders or rulers would, would work there, that would be where all the offices were. Like if it was in modern times, you'd have the, um, uh, what is that called, the, the capital. And so it, the gate of the city was a very important place. If you wanted to look for somebody, you would wait by the city gates because they would come in there or, or they, would, they would either leave or come in because that's, the, the cities were walled. And so the gates were, they were an important place. That's where these lepers are going to be. So verse 2, Then a lord on whose hand the king leaned, he was the king's assistant, assistants, 
answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, okay, so this is what he's saying. If the Lord would make windows of heaven, <laughs> this could not happen. There is no way that tomorrow at this time, our financial situation is going to be turned around to that extent. There is no way, even if the Lord made windows that were coming straight out of heaven, it would not happen. Have you ever heard that phrase, windows of heaven? I mean, I know there's a song, right? The windows of heaven are open, right? How's it go? Mm-hmm. There is joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. Well, how's it go? No, the other part. He's taking my garment. Everyone's singing a different part of the song. <laughs> he taking my what? My my old tattered garments or something. He yeah. He gave me a robe up here white. I'm feasting from manna. I'm feasting on manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy tonight. I should be a singer, yeah. <laughs> Who said no? <laughs> Do you remember where you heard that, that word or that phrase, windows of heaven? Oh, you're not Robert. You don't get to play. What's that? Windows of no. Where in the Bible? Like what passage? <laughs> oh, you got it. Whoa. I fight from a dis. Yes, exactly right. In Malachi, the Lord says one time in the scriptures, only one time in the scriptures does the Lord say, he says, prove me, test me. Only one time he says, test me. Malachi, let me read it. That's what you was going to say, Robert. Yeah. So we'll look at Malachi. So Malachi chapter 3. Let's um, back up to verse 8. Will a man rob God? Question mark. Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now, herewith saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. So he says, Prove me now, herewith saith the Lord of hosts. Prove me. Only time in the scripture that he says that. If I will not do this. And so that's a, another place where we see that. Where we see the phrase, windows of heaven. Very good. But there was a person there that doubted God, right? Is there, is there a person in here that doubts God? Is there someone that says, no, it's... If I give my tithes and offerings that the Lord is not, you know, he's not going to open up the windows of heaven. You know, he's not going to bless me. I mean, is there, do we have any doubters here tonight? Well, there was a doubter here in the story. And God said that this is going to happen through the man of God. And he says, there is no way. There is no way. And there are a lot of doubters out there. If you're going to tell people that Jesus is coming back, there are some people that's going to say, no, he's not. Or if you talk about the rapture, there's even Christians that's going to say, oh, there's not going to be any such thing as a rapture. And they actually mock it and make fun of it. There's a lot of doubters. there, There are people that say that the Bible is not the word of God. There are people that say the Bible is not the word of God. They doubt it. They say it was just written by 
It was just written by man, and man just made it up. No, yeah, God used men to write it, but God inspired them. There's no way that this, Bi- that this Bible could be just the work of men. I mean, do you think that you could get 40 men together, even if they just were in one room together at the same time? And here you got 40 men that lived hundreds of years apart, that did not know. Do you think the first author, Moses, talked to John, the last author, about what to write? <laughs> they, lived, they lived thousands of years apart. You have 40 different men. They lived in different areas of the world, right? They, were, they, they had different, they were different kind of uh, um, backgrounds, different vocations. You had a king, David, right? You had fishermen. You have uh, um, someone wrote it in a, uh, while he was in the wilderness. You had some that wrote it while they were in the palace. I mean, you have such vast differences in the way the Bible is put together. And yet, when you read the Bible, it is as if one author is writing one story, and there is one storyline that goes from beginning to ending, and, a, and the one major theme is Jesus Christ and the redemption of mankind. Because there is one author, God. (laughs) But he used all these men. And the Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction. It's profitable to us. In fact, Peter, who saw Jesus Christ transfigured before him on Mount Transfiguration, he said that I was there on the mount, but we have a more sure word of prophecy. And he's, re- he's referring to the Word of God. But yet you have those that doubt. So divine prophecy, verse 1. Doubt, verse 2. Then a Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, so now Elijah says, Elisha says to him, and he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes but shall not eat thereof. He says, you know what? You're going to see it happen, but you're not going to get to enjoy it. Isn't that sad? You're going to see it. Mark it down. You will see it, but you will not get to partake of it. Man, I want to partake of it. I want to partake of the blessings. But he says, no, because you doubt. There are a lot of people that doubt God. There are people that doubt God when it comes to tithes and offerings. There are people that doubt God when it comes to the will of God. Do you know, I remember, the, I remember when, when the Lord was calling me to preach, and I doubted God at first because I wanted to be a firefighter. I wanted to follow in the footsteps of my father. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not what God wanted for me. I wanted to be a firefighter, and I wanted to be a carpenter. That's what I wanted. And the Lord called me to preach, and I was thinking, that's not what I want to do. I want to be a firefighter. I want to, I want, I, when, when, when I used to watch my father at Power Fire Station, which is right, you know, now it's Don, it used to be Holiday Mart, it was by Don Quixote. They had, the, they had search and rescue there. They had the ladder there, and they had the, they had the, um, the engine. So the, you had three companies, three trucks that were there, and you had a lot of firemen that were there. And sometimes when the alarm went off, all three companies had to go. And when that happened, it was intense. I mean, the, Alarms are going off. Could be 2 in the morning. They're rushing around. They never did slide down that pole, though. They always would come down the stairs. But only us kids went down that pole. <laughs> that was for us, that pole. But they would be hustling, getting all our gear together, jumping on the truck, and, they would, and it would be loud. The, the, the um, sirens would be going off. They'd be uh, beeping their horn. That horn was loud, too. I mean, I accidentally stepped on the horn one time. I mean, we don't have time to tell that story, huh? <laughs> There's this lady, and she was very, very old. And she was in a wheelchair. And, she was, and I was sitting in a fire truck like I was pretending I was driving it. You know? And there was this lady right in front of the, wheel, right in front of the fire truck. And I, wanted, I don't know why I wanted to see her. She was, you know, she was just, you know, on her wheelchair. And so I just wanted to kind of look maybe to see if she was, you know, maybe if she was coming in or she was kind of continue on. I just went to look at her and I act. You know where the horn is, yeah? It's on the floor. It's on the floor. 
that horn that goes, Meh! that real loud one. So I went to stand up to see her, and I stepped on the horn. And she was right in front of me. That thing is loud, too. Can you imagine going like this? And it's like, and one of the firemen saw that. Oh, and I got in trouble. But I didn't do it on purpose, but it seemed like it. They're probably thinking, hey, he's in the truck, and there's a lady. Uh, she's in then, <laughs> Maybe that's why the Lord said, ah, he can't be a firefighter. <laughs> Call him the preacher or something. <laughs> and, and I doubted that that's... that's because I, I was thinking this, that's not what I wanted to do. And so when I did finally surrender, I surrendered, but it wasn't like, oh, yes, thank you, Lord, for calling me to preach. How exciting. I was thinking, oh, man, I don't want to do that, but I'll do it. That's how it was. But I'm glad I surrendered to preach. I'm glad that I went to Bible school. I mean, imagine that. If I didn't go to Bible school, I wouldn't have never met Roxanne. So, in fact, there was a time in my life where there was some, someone that I wanted to marry when I was in high school. I even prayed to God that he would allow me to marry this girl. Thank God for the prayer request that God says no to. Never doubt God. If God is Impressing upon or putting, putting something on your heart to do, do it. He might be calling you to preach. He might be calling you to the mission field. He might be calling you to get more involved in the church. He may want you to, to take the next step in your, in your uh, Christian walk. You're saved. You're baptized. What's the next step for you? you know, if you're not saved, get saved. If you're, if you're saved and not baptized... Get baptized. We need a plan of baptism. There's been some people that had, have that have been asking me when we're going to have our next baptism. So we're going to plan one. When we plan one, if you've never been baptized, that's the thing. Can't take, take that next step. And then after that, join the church. Get committed. And get discipled. That would be another good step. Get discipled. And if you've been discipled, look for someone to disciple. Look for someone that needs a, you know, you think, man, it looks like they need a friend. Be their friend. Get involved. He said, I don't know who to disciple. Disciple your children. Sometimes just hanging around with people is, is a good form of discipleship. Just being with, spending time with them. Just ask them to go with you where, when you're doing something that you normally do. Invite them for, you know, coffee or something or lunch or whatever but or ask the lord lord what do you want me to do lay something on my heart that i can do to take that next step in my christian life and don't doubt the lord the next thing is decision so here you have this guy who doubts that this would ever happen and then now the scene shifts to these four men i don't know if, if this is true but I was just going to read this. Unfounded Jewish traditions say that these four were actually Gehazi. Remember the story of Gehazi? And his three sons. Because remember, he became a leper, right? And it even says him and his family, right? I don't know. Because of his greed toward uh, Naaman and what had happened. So I don't know if that's the case. But, but we know that there are four leprous men. And they are sitting at the, they are at the gate of the city. It says, verse 3, There were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? So these men would sit at the gate of the city, and they'd wait for the scraps. They'd wait for the trash to be thrown over the gate, and then they would rummage through it and try to get, find something to eat. And I'm sure you've seen at some point people going through trash cans, right? trying to find something to eat. It's sad when you see that. But people are they're hungry and they're trying to rummage through the. Have you ever seen the video? It was uh, viral and, and it was circulating several years ago when 
I think it was Venezuela was going through a, a, a famine. And in these communistic countries, you have those that are the, the um, upper echelon or the ones that, I guess, control everything, where they have all the money. So the, tra- the rubbish trucks would go up into the communities. I'm sure it was gated. They'd go up there, and it would pick up all the trash. And then these people would follow these garbage trucks around until they would dump the trash. And then when they did, man, you would have thought they were at a like a smorgasbord or a, a all-you-can-eat restaurant. They were rummaging through the trash, and they were like, I mean, smiles on their faces, and they were eating all these scraps. Like it was like they hit the jackpot. Has anybody seen those videos? Anybody remember seeing that? It was several years ago. You were thinking, what is this? It was just odd because they were going through the trash and they were smiling, they were happy. You probably could find it if you if you to Google it. Well, things were so bad in the city that there was no, there was no scraps. <laughs> I mean, when there were only bones coming over the, the, the walls in these in, in the, the trash that was being discarded, there was nothing, it was picked clean. There was nothing for them. So they thought, you know what? Why should we just sit here until we die? He said, we can sit here till we die or we can do something about it. By the way, the Lord always blesses those that are going to make an effort. You know, if, you, if there's something going wrong in your life, just make an effort. I remember a few years ago, we had a, we had a problem. And um, the property that the, where, where Ram is on, there was a bunch of rubble on there. And it was, you know, no, no one had a problem with that until we were on there. <laughs> and so now the, the rubble is a problem. It was, it's been there for years, like maybe even 20 years, 15, 20 years. I mean, grass was growing on it already and, and everything. But then when we were there, someone complained. And so the health department came and they said that we have to remove all of this rubble. And removing rubble... And there was, I don't know, I mean, I don't know, who was here back then? When, <laughs> you remember when we had all that rubble? It was tons of it. I mean, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of, ton, of tons of rubble. You don't even know what's in there, right? And I'm thinking, how are we going to get rid of this? So they gave us a year. They talked to me, and they said, you got a year to get rid of this rubble. Okay, okay. So one month passed, two months passed, three months passed, four months passed. And 10 months passed, and they called me up, and they said, okay, how are we doing on the disposal of the rubble? I said, oh, I'm not too good. What have you done so far? Nothing. <laughs> I mean, why do today? Why do now what you can do later? <laughs> and I put it off. I didn't even know what to do. So we, we, even had, we had our staff meeting, and we kind of sat around, and no one knew what we were going to do. So I had a brilliant idea. I said, you know what, let's just go out there and get a shovel and just start shoveling into the truck. We literally were going to do that. Jensen, what, you get extra trucks you can borrow? For what? We can just shovel the, huh? <laughs> you know which trucks it's going to take? Like a 1,000, <laughs> maybe more. But we did that. We just started, and you know what? Within three days, it was gone. Not from the trucks, by the way. (laughs) Just God used people. I mean, Uncle Kea. Uncle Kea called people, people, you know. It's just that when you just move in, sometimes what you're doing doesn't even seem like it makes sense, but just, just start doing something. And the Lord takes it up from there because we're very limited but he's unlimited. And so these lepers, they, they, there's nothing that they could do, but if they just sat there, they're going to just die. And they thought their logic was good. It was, it was good logic. They thought, what have we got to lose? Let's just do something. And I've, I've learned that. Just do it. Just do something, and the Lord will bless. Just like when they were going to feed the 5,000. They didn't have enough fish. But what did Jesus is teaching them? He says, okay, we have a, 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 multi, we have a multitude. What we're going to do, 
He asked Philip, Philip, so what? What are we going to do? Philip said, <laughs> said nine, eight, eight or nine months of wages is not enough that just we could feed them for, for everyone to just have a little bit. We can't do it. But he, he calculated everything up, but he didn't, he didn't enter one thing in his calculations, the fact that Jesus was with them. You know, if we got Jesus with us, then that's all we need. But he, but he wanted them to have a part in it, right? So here you have these leprous men. Verse 3 and 4. There were four leprous men at the entering into the, of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? Why are we going to just stay here until the day we die? If we say we will enter into the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. If we sit here, if we sit still here, we will die here. So if we stay here, we're going to die. If we go into the city, it, there's a famine, we're going to die. Now therefore come and let us fall under the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. But we ain't going to be any worse off. But in that situation, there is a little bit of hope. If we go to the enemies and we just cast ourselves at the feet of the enemies, if they kill us, well, we're... That ain't any worse than what's going to happen if we stay here. That's not any worse if we go into the city where the famine is. Because hey, even if there was food that came to the city, we're going to be the last ones that gets food, right? So there, we don't have any chance. But if we go to the enemies and they kill us, we die. But what if they give us some food? So they said, okay, well, let's do it. Let's do something. And they thought, maybe we're going to go to the enemy, and the enemy is going to say, hey, you're our enemy. We're going to put, throw you in prison. But they say, here's some bread and water. I mean, what do you think they were hoping for? They were probably hoping for just a little bit of bread and water. Come to think of it. Thanks for the water, son. Good to have you back. Do you have any bread? <laughs> no, but if I was writing a book, you know, I would write a, that would be one of my chapters of, of removing of the rubble. That was, oh, that was awesome to see how the Lord did that. Because I know there wasn't a whole lot, there wasn't much that I did. It was what the Lord did. But seeing the Lord work is such a blessing. And now here you have these lepers. Their logic was perfect. They would, they would be dead if they just stayed there. Every, everything they did, it's going to be the same thing. They're going to die. But the only thing that had a possibility that they could live is if the enemies had mercy on them, right? That's a, you think, well, that's not a great situation. But, hey, that's all they had. So that point is decisions. You know, we all have to make a decision for ourselves. I have to decide to do the will of God in my life. You have to decide. I can't make a decision for you just like you cannot make a decision for me. I wish I could say, man, I wish I, wish I could make a decision for let's say a particular individual in that, that's sitting in this room that may be struggling with something, or maybe they just wish their life would take, you know, take a turn for the better. I wish that I could make a decision for them because I know what would happen if they served the Lord 100%. I know what would happen, but I can't make the decision. Only thing I can do is I can, I can preach the word, and I can pray, and I can try and be as persuasive as possible. But it's, everyone is going to have to make that decision for themselves. Just like us as a parent, right? You can't make the decision. You, you can encourage your children. You can plead with them. You can pray for them. You can even threaten them, <laughs> which is probably the least 
effective. <laughs> but they have to make that choice, right? And sometimes you wish you could just, like, I mean, other parents, like our children, they make good choices, you know, but, like, other parents, and I know they want to sometimes. Life is full of choices. Choose wisely. First Kings 18.21. I'll quote this. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. They just said, hmm. Hmm. We got to make a choice. Joshua 24, verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose ye this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I like how Jesus in John chapter 6, when the huge multitude was following him because of all the miracles that he did, and he fed the 5,000, which probably was more closer to 15,000 if you count the children and, and the, the women and the children. And at the end of that chapter, towards the end, in John chapter 6, verse 66, he talks to his disciples and he tells them, or he, 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 point, he goes to the 12 and he asks them, will ye also go away? Make a choice. And what did Peter say? To whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? You know, Peter, yeah, the, the main, like the leader of, <laughs> apostle first thing I did when I went home because Rock Chan was in the nursery I said Rock can I ask you a question who's the if I was to tell you name 12 of the 12 apostles just name me three which ones would you say she said Peter James and John said, that's why I married you no. <laughs> Brother Geraldo called me up. He said he listened to the sermon. He goes, I just want you to know, brother, I would have said Peter, James, and John. <laughs> he said, but when, uh, he said, when Jason said Bartholomew, he said, I was rolling. <laughs> but that's kind of good because a lot of people didn't even know Bartholomew was an apostle. So that was, he's probably one of the only guys, you know, in, in uh, this, you know, this island that knew Bartholomew was an apostle. I was even like, who's Bartholomew? <laughs> that, was, that was funny. At the time it wasn't, but. So, decisions. They had to make a decision. And they made the right decision. I mean, here you have this one guy who's the king's right-hand man. You think that. Oh, this guy has a, he has a pretty good position. He's the king's right-hand man. Here you got these lepers. I mean, they're, they've got leprosy. They're not even allowed to go into the city. They're outcasts. They're dying of a horrid disease. And yet, they made the right decision. And they were in a whole lot better place than the other guy. Sometimes our decisions, that's, it's, it's going to make a huge difference in our life. And we see the person that doubted and what's going to happen as a result of his doubt. We see these men, that what's going to happen as a result of their decision. Verse 5. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of, of Syria, behold, there was no man there. And it could be that the way that they came into the camp, they wanted, to be, they wanted it to seem as if they came from a far distance, right? Not that they came. They probably had a plan thinking, you know, let's not just come straight from, so that that way, you know, it might appear as if we're coming from a far distant land, you know. They probably had this plan. And some say, I don't know if this is true or not, that God used them as far as they came, the way that they traveled to the uh, Syrian camp, that he, God amplified the noise that they made. You know, as they were walking and they're dragging, you know, their, uh, th their feet because they have to limp. And God just amplified the sound. And so when they're listening for the, for when, they're, when they're listening to this, they're thinking that there's a lot of people coming. They're thinking that, well, I wonder if, if the uh, Israelites hired the Egyptians from the south and the Hittites from the north, and they're coming to attack us, and we're going to be outnumbered. We better get out of here. 
and they fled. So these lepers, they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites in the north and the kings, kings of the Egyptians to the south to come upon us. And they were afraid and they fled. Remember that verse in Proverbs where it says, The wicked flee when no man pursueth? Verse 7, Wherefore they, they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. If God be for us, who can be against us? <laughs> These lepers scared them all away. Four leprous men. Why? Because they made the right choice. And they didn't even... They didn't know this was going to happen. They were expecting and hoping for just a little piece of bread. Do you know when, when, when people get saved, I don't know if this is how it was for you. Sometimes when people get saved, they think, it's going to be a boring life. We're probably going to sit in the church building and meditate. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Holy. You know, sometimes you don't know what to think, right, when you become a Christian. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know what everything was going to be about. I mean, I'm, I, I grew up Catholic, and I just kind of thought it was going to be similar, and, you know, I didn't know. I didn't know, like I said, I didn't even know what the difference between Old and the New Testament was. I thought, the, you know, that the, um, the New Testament, it was just kind of like um, in Prudence, same stories, but they had to kind of like redo it. I didn't know anything. And when we receive Jesus Christ, we may not really realize or understand all how, how exciting it is. That it's the best possible life you could ever live. That the devil, he just, he advertised and, and he, he tries to sell us on the prime rib he's going to give us. But when the time comes, all he gives us is pig slop. That's all he got. He promises freedom, but he delivers bondage, right? But then when we look at the will of God. The devil tries to paint a picture like it's going to be boring. But when we live it, it's the most exciting life you could possibly ever live. Holiness and a holy life is the most exciting life that you could ever possibly live. But sometimes what we don't, the problem we don't have, well, the problem with us is sometimes we don't have faith. Verse 8, and when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. I wish, it, I wish we could see the video of what it was like for these leprous men. They're coming there like, well, everybody stay. Well, where do they stay? Maybe they're, you know, the other part of the, you know, they came inside and they saw all this food. I mean, it was just as if they got raptured. I mean, everything is just still set up. The horse, it's just like they just dug out. So they go into the tent, there's all this food. They're, star they're starving to death, literally. So they see this food and just start gobbling it down. Like, oh, wow, they're just eating. And they see all this stuff. We better take some with us. And so they took all the, the, the silver, the gold, the treasure, and they hid it. <laughs> And then they went to the next tent, and same thing. And they kept seeing this, and, they, and they're thinking, what is going on? I mean, the Bible does say that God is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we could ask or think. We're expecting just a little piece of bread, and here they're having some of the probably the most tastiest and most nutritious food that, that money could buy. And all these riches there just for their taking. So they did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment. And you know what kind of clothes these guys had too. Yeah, was, what's that expensive clothes again? 
What does those handbags do? Louis Vuitton. Yeah, they had Louis Vuitton handbags. And the real expensive clothes. I forget the names of it. So that point is delight. To their delight. They made the, the right choice. And because of it, they were blessed. But as they were doing this, as they were feeding themselves, as, it, as they were taking in all the treasure, they all of a sudden had a thought. Huh. We should go tell the others. We should go tell the people that are starving. So then we see declare, verse 9 through 11. Then they said one to another, We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings. This is a day of good news. And we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. He says, this is not, the Lord is not going to be happy with us if we're enjoying all the riches. We're all this great food and we're not sharing it with those that are starving. Our own people. And now they're outcast. But the Israelites, the children of Israel, they're eating their own children right now. They're starving to death. We need to let them know. You know, that's how we should feel. You know, here we are enjoying the will of God. Here we are enjoying the, the word of God. We're enjoying the, uh, the, the passages of Scripture. We're enjoying the truth. We have truth in our life. We know where we came from, right? We know why we're here. We have purpose in life. That's extremely important. We know where we're going when we leave here. We have the answers of how to have a good marriage. We know how to be a good parent. We know how to be a good employer or an employee. We know how to be a good citizen. We, we have all the answers. We know which restrooms to use. <laughs> we know what gender we're supposed to marry. We, we know what gender we are. You know, when there's an application, like when I filled out an application to work for Roberts, you know, and they asked me a question. It wasn't a hard question. Gender, male. That was easy. <laughs> But you know, there are some people, they, they go from different ones too. They, they, they shift. They go from you know, one to another and they transition to a different one. And some things that are the most basic. We have the truth. You know, not only that, it's a blessing for me that Kaysen is getting married in uh, November. That's a blessing. And he's marrying uh, Wahini. That's a blessing. Praise the Lord. I praise the Lord for that. You know, years ago, that, you didn't think that that was, you just think that was a given, right? Not now, right? But when you raise your children up in, in church, when you raise them to do the will of God, most likely, I mean, they're going to make their own decision, but they're going to most likely make the decision to, and nowadays, you're so happy when they make the right decision, right? To marry the right gender. Good job. Good job. They, they like when I include them in the sermon. <laughs> and not only that, he marries someone who was raised on the mission field. She speaks Filipino. That's a blessing. Yeah. And um, they were raised up. You know, she was raised up the same basic way that he was raised up. They have the same beliefs. They're in church today. Those things are extremely important. Okay, now let me talk about Kimi and Micah. <laughs> you ever heard Micah preach? He preaches, yeah. He's still called a preacher. Well, it just depends what Kimi says. No. <laughs> nah. Sorry, they, they don't like me to. I'm going to Take it back, I take it back. So you're not going to name the baby after me now? No. <laughs> Nowadays you can see the baby in the, the three, three-dimensional three um, ultrasound, yeah? And they were saying, they were saying, Dad, we're so excited. Looks like the baby has your nose. 
No, it's more like this. It's more like this. <laughs> <Yeah. Huh? laughs> no, it's more like this. Oh, man. Looks like the baby has your nose. I'm like, that's good, right? No, actually, actually, my original noses were very, it was a very skinny nose, very slim. It was a small nose, and then Yuki punched me in the face. And, then, and all I was trying to do was protect Jensen. And bam, and then now it's like this, so. They're saying, yeah, yeah, talk, talk about somebody else. But you see, these lepers, they, they got there, and here they were in one, one minute before they made the decision. They were starving to death. They had no hope. All of their possibilities was death, death, death. And maybe, maybe we'll get a piece of bread. But they made the right decision, and look what they got. To me, that's, that's what it's like to be a Christian. You're just expecting just a little piece of bread. And then, boom, God gives you the most exciting thrilling life you could ever imagine i mean i get to be a pastor of a church that has the ram ministry and it's never a dull moment man i don't hey i don't need to you know sometimes people like to watch you know they what they, they like to watch videos of people like you know there's a lot of action videos or action-packed movies i, I just gotta come i just gotta come into work that's it i just gotta show up Never a dull moment. You know, people say one of the curses of uh, uh, the 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 curses of being a, a human being is loneliness and boredom. I definitely don't have the boredom one. Don't got that one. And uh, it's a blessing. It's a blessing to be in the will of God. It's a blessing to be involved with ministry. I would not I, I honestly enjoy being a part of Winter Baptist Church and around ministry. It's exciting. Never a dull moment. I take it all, good, bad, and the ugly. <laughs> yeah, so the baby's going to come out. It's going to, like that Akana nose, yeah. <laughs> Declare. They said, hey, we got it. We're going to have to tell, we're going to have to say something. You and I have such a privilege of having the word of God, having truth, having salvation. We know we're gonna, where we're going to go when we die. If we don't tell people, they said, we do not well if we don't say something. I mean, you got people starving to death. You got people eating their own children. We got our own people, our own relatives, our own loved ones, and they're dying. We've got to say something. That's how we should feel. We've got to say something. Yeah, but they don't want to listen. You know what? We can't force them, but we've got to tell them. Right. We've got to tell them. You know, maybe that's what we should do. Focus the, re in this, the rest of this week. I want to tell one person at least. I want to witness to one person. I want to just call someone and just let them know how good God is and all the blessings that I have received since I've received Jesus Christ. So they said, we need to say something. We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings. This is a day of good news. And we hold our peace. If we tarry till morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now, therefore, come that we may go and tell the king's household. Let's go tell the king. So they came and called unto the porter of the city. And they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians. And behold, there was no man there. Neither voice of man, but horses tied, and asses tied, and the tents as they were. And he called the porters, and they told it to the king's house within. And they're not going to believe. Well, the king's not going to believe. So they declared, they did their part. All we can do is our part. And the king denounces what they say. So that's verse 12. The king arose in the night and said unto his servants, I will now show you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we be hungry. It's a trap. They know we're hungry. So what they're doing is they're acting like they left everything, but they're just hiding out around the corner. As soon as we come out, they're going to attack us. 
It's a trap. You know, sometimes when, when the message is preached, some people say, it's a trap. They just want your money. It's a trap. What the Bible is not, it's not the word of God. It's not what they say it is. There is no heaven. They don't care about you. They're very mean. And they'll start to say things about Christians. They'll start to say things about religious leaders and some of the things that they have done in the past. And they'll start bringing up things to make it look as if it's a trap. And sometimes, you know, if you start witnessing and it's amazing You could be witnessing to somebody and and everything seems to be going well. And once you get to that point where you're trying to encourage them to receive the Lord, something happens. Someone calls them on the phone or someone comes home or some interruption. You know, the devil, he's, he's fighting. And here you have these lepers who meant well. What they were saying is the truth and the king doesn't believe or he thinks it's a trap. I will now show you what the Syrians have done. They know that we be hungry. Therefore, are they gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, when they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into the city. So he's denouncing what they're saying. But then now we see definite fulfillment. The last thing, verse 13 through 20. When the Lord says something is going to happen, it's going to happen. If he says that at this time, 24 hours later, that the financial situation and the problems that's happening in Samaria is going to be a thing of the past, that food is going to be very affordable and in abundance, definite fulfillment. When Jesus said, let not your hearts be be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. That's true. If we were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. That's true. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. He is coming again. And I will receive you unto myself, because he is. That where I am, there ye will be also. That is a guaranteed thing. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness. But he's long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And when the Lord says something, it will come to pass. The f- definite fulfillment. And one of his servants answered and said, Let some take, I pray thee, five of the horses that remain, which are left in the city. Oh, that's all horses had. Take all the horses. Had only five left. So take five of the horses that remain, which are left in the city. Behold, they are, are as all the multitude of Israel that are left in it. Behold, I say that are even as all the multitude of the Israelites that are consumed. And let us send and see. They took, therefore, two chariot horses. And the king sent after the host of the Syrians, saying, Go and see. And they went after them unto Jordan. And lo, all the way was full of garments and vessels which the Syrians had cast away in their haste. They were trying to get out of there so fast. They were just, let, they're just stripping them, their, all the extra baggage and just throwing it aside, casting it aside. And so they saw that. And the messengers returned and told the king. And the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. So a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel. Just as, just, like God said. And two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. And the king appointed the Lord on whose hand he leaned to have the charge of the gate. And the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died, as the man of God had said, who spake when the king came down to him. And it came to pass, as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, Two measures of barley for a shekel and a measure of fine flour for a shekel shall be tomorrow about this time in the gate of Samaria. And that Lord answered the man of God and said, Now behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, might such a thing be. And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. And so it fell out unto him, for the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died. 
So they, when, when they went and they got all the stuff, when they gathered the spoil together, then there was such abundance that the, the amount that someone had to spend on, you know, like we said, when uh, plate lunch, extra scoop rice, extra scoop mac salad, mixed plate, chicken katsu with um, mahi-mahi for $5. And he saw it, but everyone was so excited and it was rushing LNL and he got in the way and they ran him over and he died. He saw it. He saw it come to pass that what the Lord said would happen, happened. He saw it, but he was not able to enjoy it. You know, the Bible's, the Bible says that every, that every, Every eye will see, and every knee shall bow. They're, they're going to see that Jesus is Lord. They're going to acknowledge him one day in that way, but they will not get be able to enjoy the blessings of heaven. That every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. They're going to see him. They're going to acknowledge that he is Lord. He is God in the flesh. He is who the, the Christians, he is who my cousin said he, that he is. It is true. I see it now. He is Lord. But they're going to be cast into the lake of fire because they never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Just like this, this man here, the word of God was spoken to him and he mocked it. And he said, even if God were, were to put windows in heaven and open up the windows of heaven, even if he could do that, this would not happen. And the man of God says, okay, it will happen. When it happens, you will see it, but you will not get to partake of it. And exactly what God said is exactly what happened. And God has not changed. You know, the Bible says Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible says, I am the Lord. I change not. All of, all of his promises are going to come to pass. Everything that he says will happen. And just like Jesus said, there where I am, there you will be also. Just like the Bible says, in a moment, in a twinkling of, of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. We're going to be raptured. We're going to meet him in the clouds. And then we shall ever be with the Lord. Whatever the Lord says is going to happen, it will happen. Just like he says. Just like, you ever heard that saying where someone had said, God said it. I believe it, that settles it. Then the next person said, he said, that's pretty good, but it's really more like this. God said it, that settles it, whether I believe it or not. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And he said, the thief, the devil, cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants people to get to, uh, he wants people to go to hell with him. The thief, he's a thief. He's a liar. But he cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and life more abundant. He wants everyone to have eternal life and an abundant life on earth. And if you live your life in the will of God, you will have that light. But we have to have faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. And faith honors God. And God will honor our faith. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? With, head, with heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around. First thing is most important. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Are you 100%?